on one side, I read books by David Sorensen, David Cloud, uh, even Sam Gipp a little bit. And I knew there was some hinky stuff there, but I'm like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to hear what he says. And then on the other end, I'm reading DA Carson, Mark Ward, uh, James White, and I'm coming to it saying, I have to understand what each side is saying. They have some valid points, but what finally broke me was when I read, and I have it right here, the preface to the King James translation. I didn't realize, and it spurred in my memory, that there was this preface that was in there. I remember even hearing about it in Bible college, and I bought a modern English version of it on Amazon, and I began to read through this and highlight it and mark it and devour it trying to understand why did they make this translation. And to my astonishment and even horror at the time, I found out that the King James translators were not King James only. In this video, I'm going to review a book entitled The Forgotten Preface, which deals with a young man who left the King James position because of the preface to the King James Version. And today we are seeing a mass defection of young people who are leaving fundamental churches and a Bible-believing position for paths that have been marked as being extremely dangerous, and they're doing so with their eyes wide open in many cases. This, uh, the author of this book was trained in a good fundamental school, but he has moved away from the position that he's been taught. And this is more than a review of a book. It's also aimed at showing the shallowness and lack of understanding as to the dangers that await those that go down these paths. Let me start by saying that what you believe about God will determine what you believe about Scripture. And if you believe in a sovereign God who gave His Word to His prophets, uh, not just in thoughts but in words, then you'll have a certain view of the Bible. And you cannot have a high view of God and a low view of Scripture. Those things are incompatible. And if you have a high view of God, then decisions about where you're going to find the Bible are going to be easy for you. You will believe God when He says, For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name, Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And just recently, a group of independent Baptists got together for a conference down in Florida to train other people on how to move their churches away from a King James position. And I'm not surprised by that. Uh, this is a day of apostasy, and we're going to see more and more of this kind of stuff as the day of the Lord gets nearer. And it was in looking into this conference that I became aware of this book and the author as he was being interviewed by Brian Sams, the leader of that conference. And he said that in reading the preface to the King James Version, he found support for abandoning the King James and uh, for more modern versions. And I was very interested in that. I wanted to see what it was that he found in the King James preface that would lead him in that direction. And I've been through the book about three times. It's a small book, about 100 pages. For the sake of those that are watching this, I want to quickly cover a few of the points in the book so you get a sense of where he's coming from. But then I want to give you some critical information that he's left out of this book. And I'm not going to cover all the points in the book. I'm going to cover about half of them. Uh, he has 10. I'm going to cover five. Uh, but let's just start here. Point number one, the King James translators believe that any attempt to produce a modern translation of the Bible would be met with resistance and suspicion. I would say that's true, but sometimes resistance and suspicion are valid. They're not always wrong, especially when we know that Satan is busy and he's afoot whispering, hath God said. So resistance and suspicion are warranted in many cases. Number two, the King James translators believe that the Bible should be available in the common English of the then present age. And I'm not really sure that many people object to that point, so we're just going to move on from that. Number three is somewhat covered in the fourth point, so we'll jump to number four. Fourth, the King James translators believe that differing translations and even faulty translations are still the Word of God. I guess it really depends on what he means by faulty. Faulty is his word. It's not used in the preface to the King James Version, and so he's interpreted them to have said that. But nevertheless, faulty as in not optimum but still accurate, well, that's one thing, but if you mean faulty as in modified or mistranslated or edited in some way, that's not okay. So again, we must define what Barzon means by faulty as that is his word. Ninth, the King James translators did not believe in an absolute word-for-word -word translation. They sometimes use dynamic equivalents, and I would absolutely object to the way that he has framed this point. He misrepresents what the preface said and what the translators believed, and on top of that, he inserts a 
uh, statement about dynamic equivalency, which is misleading. In the preface, the King James translators defended their use of translating words differently depending on the context. They said this, We have not tied ourselves to uniform phrasing or to the use of identical words. Why use one exclusively when we may use another that is no less appropriate? And that is considerably different than saying that the King James translators did not believe in word-for-word -word translation, which they clearly did believe in. As for his statement about dynamic equivalence, all translations are going to use dynamic equivalence uh, on a sparing and incidental basis to carry a translation over into another language. That's dynamic equivalence lowercase. The translators knew nothing about dynamic equivalence as a method of translation or a philosophy. That's a modern thing. And therefore, they made no comment on that whatsoever. They did not use thought-for-thought -thought translation. They used word-for-word -word translation principles. And it's a major deception to suggest that they would approve of dynamic equivalency as a method of translation. When I'm talking about dynamic equivalence lowercase, I'm talking about the fact that languages are idiomatic. And what you say in one language may just not translate to another language. I was in Nepal one time and I told an English-speaking cab driver to hold on. Well, the missionary I was with said, he doesn't know what you're talking about. Uh, anybody in America would know what I meant by hold on, but he thought I was talking about grab something because that's an American idiom. It, would made, it made no sense to him. And then number 10, the King James translators believed that God was blessing their endeavor regardless of what the established church and the religious crowd thought. Again, the translator said nothing like this. He's taken their closing remarks and reframed them and then added his own biased statement into the mix. Here's what they said. Many other things we might warn you of, gentle reader, if we had not exceeded the suitable length of a preface already. It remains for us to commend you to God and to the Spirit of His grace, which is able to build further than we can ask or think. He removes the scales from our eyes, the veil from our hearts, opening our wits that we may understand His word, enlarging our hearts, yes, correcting our inclinations, that we may love it above gold and silver, yes, that we may love it to the end. And this statement by the translator says nothing about God blessing them or the contentions of a religious crowd. Those are simply inserted by the author. And to this, he adds an incredibly biased summary or overview of their prayer. And he, he reframes things in his words. Here's what he says to close his book. May God continue to remove the scales from men's eyes to behold his word in their common tongue. May God continue to remove the veil of ignorance from the hearts of men bent on idolizing a particular translation. And may God open the mind, enlarge the heart, and correct our inclinations in order to love His Word more than earthly wealth or status. May God continue to honor the final words of the King James translators. His references to a veil of ignorance and idolizing a particular translation are noted. And he mischaracterizes what the preface said at the end. The preface prayed that we would love God's Word above gold and silver, which is clearly a reference to Psalm 119.72. But somehow that becomes wealth and status in Barzon's interpretation, which certainly changes the image presented. But in framing the tenth point, he refers condescendingly to what he calls the religious crowd. And this is the second time he has inserted that phrase into his summary of the preface. And clearly those who defend the use of the King James are the religious crowd in his mind. Uh, but I will tell you, this is a new feeling for me, a totally new experience. I don't believe I've ever been in the religious crowd before, not that I knew about. Uh, in my experience, the religious crowd is the popular crowd that has all the big buildings and the, and the respect of society. Uh, the religious crowd is the mass of Christianity that doesn't care one iota for faithfulness, but yet holds all the powerful positions in the major institutions. I do not believe and have never believed that the narrow fundamentalist sect outside of the mainstream, which defends the King James Version, are the religious crowd. But at this point, we want to get to the main problem with his entire book and his entire premise, and that is that he takes the preface of the King James Version out of context. What do we mean by context? Well, the context of their time. Their time was totally different than our time. The King James was produced in an age of faith. We live in an age of unbelief. 
These are two different ages entirely. This is an age of unbelief even among those who purport to handle the Word of God. We can't even fathom the differences between their day and ours. In 1611, almost everyone believed in God. That would be from the king all the way down to the lowliest peasant. You could not advance in society unless you were Catholic or Protestant, depending on where you lived. The earliest men that we call scientists, Galileo, Isaac Newton, Gottfried Leibniz, lived in the age surrounding this period, and they all believed in God in their own way. Edward Dolnick, who wrote The Clockwork Universe, said this, By far the most important of the 17th century's bedrock beliefs was this, the universe had been arranged by an all-knowing, all-powerful Creator. To a degree we can hardly imagine the 1600s were a God-drenched era. Atheism was literally unthinkable. The idea that God did not exist made no sense. No one living in that day could have even imagined a day like ours where every major societal institution accepts an atheistic view of human origins and a purposeless Big Bang. In the early 1600s, God was the author of everything, especially the Scripture. King James translators lived in days when men accepted God's Word by faith and tried to understand the world through the light of the Word. That is not the day we live in. Everything today is completely rationalistic and humanistic. But the era of the Reformation was about to end and it was going to give way to a completely new age with a new mindset. In the history books, this next period of history would be the so-called Age of Reason, and it's described as a movement that emphasized reason over superstition and science over blind faith. Well, that's a biased statement. This period is also known as the Enlightenment, but in reality it's the opening of a doorway to darkness where man is going to free himself, he thinks, from Scripture and live apart from God, make his own way in the world. The Enlightenment paved the way for communism and evolution and rationalism and moral relativism, which have in their turn produced confusion and death and misery on a grand scale. Our society is now in the death throes of the path man started down during the Enlightenment. When a man can decide that he's a woman or any other thing than what he actually is, uh, man's reason has run its natural course and we have descended into absurdity, tragic absurdity. There's currently a man in prison who transitioned into a woman and now has transitioned into a baby. And prison guards are now treating this male prisoner as if he is a female baby, supplying him with diapers and blending his food, and turning it into baby food and giving him dolls to play with. God scorned this day before it ever arrived. It says in Romans, first chapter, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And that is certainly the case with us today. But Enlightenment philosophy was nowhere more devastating than it was in the field of biblical criticism. Man began to scrutinize the Bible in a new way. He no longer accepted it as being of divine origin. In the age of reason, the Bible became merely a human book with human origins, and that's the way it began to be treated. Almost immediately after the publication of the King James Version, atheistic textual criticism began to arise in Germany. Supposed scholars began to postulate natural origins for the Word of God as opposed to the supernatural origins that the King James translators would have assumed. Let's consider just five men from Germany, all Johans, who were prominent in the development of textual criticism. They were Johann Jacob Wettstein, who was born in 1657, Johann Bengel, born in 1687, Johann Salomo Simler, 1725, Johann Jacob Greisbach, 1745, and Johann Gottfried Eichhorn, 1752. And we don't have time to discuss all of the various theories that these men put forward, but they had imbibed the skepticism and the rationalism of the day that they were living in, and they brought it to bear on the Scriptures. They didn't believe it was possible that God had preserved His Word, and so uh, they believed that it had just been handed down by men. And rather than accepting the traditional text that the King James translators used, they sought to assemble a text from all available sources. And they proudly proclaimed that they were at work restoring the Scriptures. But this is an exercise that is going to produce doubt and not faith. Each of these men worked on various methods by which they introduced variant readings into the Scriptures. 
And Bible believers at that time rejected these methods as they said that they were actually being, the Word of God was actually being undermined by these things, which it was. And they introduced philosophies that are still with us today. Bingle, for instance, developed the theory that the more difficult reading is to be preferred. Well, what about the correct reading? And their theories opened the door to wholesale unbelief by Bible scholars. Well, of course, the next logical step in this downward spiral of unbelief is that if the scriptures themselves, we don't know where they came from, how do we even know who wrote them? And so the next challenge was to question the authorship of the scripture. Julius Wellhausen was a major contributor to the JEDP theory, which says that the Pentateuch was not written by Moses, but rather by four types of authors, the Jehovahist, the Elohist, the Deuteronomist, and the priestly class. Well, again, we don't have time to look at all of the various theories and spend a lot of time on these men, but you can look them up. The, the information is readily available. Uh, Brother Cloud and D.A. Wade and Dr. Sorensen have all uh, done some excellent research on this. There's many, you can look them up on the internet. Wikipedia will absolutely tell you what they did. Carl Lachman was the first who published a critical edition of the Greek text in 1831. And this is the first major edition of the underlying text of the scripture that broke with the traditional text. He sought to reconstruct the original biblical text using what he called scientific methods and principles. And this is the groundwork that led up to the age of Westcott and Hort. And the one thing that Westcott and Hort do is that they prove to us that modern scholarship cannot give us a Bible in the English language that we can have any confidence in. Under their leadership, they led a committee which had only assembled to modernize the authorized version. They led this committee to replace that version with an entirely new text that had more than 10,000 alterations, omissions, and additions. That is 7% of the Bible. And where did they get the philosophy for doing that? Well, they got it from German rationalists. They did not get it from faithful men who believed in pure scripture. Well, the end of rationalism and Bible skepticism is theological modernism. That's the age that we live in. Modernism is a worldview ushered in by the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment provided a new guardian of truth to replace the church, science. Modernism, therefore, proffered the idea that mankind, armed with rationalism and science, is able to access absolute truth and make unlimited progress toward a better life for itself. Therefore, at its core, modernity is a celebration of human autonomy. And theological modernism is simply the fruit of human autonomy sitting in judgment of God's Word. Modernism interprets Christianity through the lens of modern knowledge, science, and ethics. It emphasizes the importance of reason and experience over doctrinal authority. Gary Dorian said that modernism is characterized by an acceptance of Darwinian evolution and a utilization of modern biblical criticism. When a man examines God according to man's standards, God is always going to come up short. And no group of people have ever had a lower view of God and of the Scripture than the modernists do, at least not while still calling themselves Christians. At this point in the story, in the mid-1800s to late 1800s, uh, this kind of unbelief, modernistic unbelief, could only be espoused in the upper echelons of academia. Uh, most uh, Christian institutions of higher education were still Bible-believing in the broad sense of the word. But that was about to change, and as it changed, the modernist and the fundamentalist went to war over these issues in the early part of the 20th century. Bible-believing Christians tried to maintain their hold on mainstream Christianity, but it is a well-known fact that they lost that war, and mainstream Christianity fell to modernism and to unbelief. And because the spiritual grandchildren of the King James translators lost the war for belief in among what I would call the religious crowd, the entire overarching structure of acceptable mainstream uh, Bible scholarship is modernistic to the core today. They follow the Johans and the rationalists. They did not follow men who believed that the Bible was God's pure and preserved word. What is the fruit of human reason when it's applied to a supernatural subject like the Scripture? Well, the rationalist must strip away everything that he cannot understand with his rational mind. He must do away with everything that is supernatural. It's beyond his understanding.
And this can easily be seen by looking at the most prominent Bible scholar of the last hundred years, that is Bruce Metzger. And Metzger was held by liberals and conservatives of like during his life. He was absolutely peerless among Bible scholars. What does he think of a supernatural Bible? Well, I have the, uh, the Reader's Digest condensed Bible. It doesn't look very condensed, but they took out a lot of the text and, and put in a lot of pictures. But, uh, but let's see what he says here about the book of Genesis. Nearly all modern scholars agree that like the other books of the Pentateuch, Genesis is a composite of several sources embodying traditions that go back in some cases to Moses. Well, I'm surprised he gave Moses that much credit, but uh, you will remember JEDP theory. That's, that's what's at work here. But Jesus said this, For had ye believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? So Jesus said, you cannot even believe in him if you reject the words of Moses. That's his opinion about it. Note on the flood, archaeological evidence suggests that traditions of a prehistoric flood covering the whole earth are heightened versions of local inundations, for example, in the Tigris-Euphrates basin. He late dates Job, thinks there are two authors of Isaiah, two authors of First and Second Peter, and all the other things that go along with biblical criticism. But he's not alone. Robert Bratcher created a dynamic equivalency Bible for the Southern Baptist in the 1970s, and he got in trouble for saying the quiet part out loud. He said this, Only willful ignorance or intellectual dishonesty can account for the claim that the Bible is inerrant and infallible. No truth-loving, God-respecting, Christ-honoring believer should be guilty of such heresy. To invest the Bible with the qualities of inerrancy and infallibility is to idolize it, to transform it into a false god. And so you see where we've come from the King James translators to modern Bible scholarship today. Well, uh, Bratcher got in trouble for making that statement. The, the American Bible Societies had to let him go, but the United Bible Societies was right there ready to take him in because that's what they believe, and so did the American Bible Societies, but uh, they got in trouble with conservatives for letting, that, letting the cat out of the bag. Well, we said at the beginning of this review that Barzon had left some critical information out of his book, and you ought to be able to see now what that is. Uh, the last 400 years of history uh, in, in dealing with the Bible version issue has completely destroyed the idea that the King James translators would ever recommend uh, modern Bible scholarship as compatible or the same as their own. They are from absolutely from two different worlds. They are completely incompatible. They don't uh, they don't go together whatsoever. One is built on faith in God and the other is built on unbelief and human reason. And they're not comparable to each other in any way. Well, let me tell you where this road leads to that bars on his own and he wants to lead others down. It leads to a loss of faith, sometimes completely. One of Bruce Metzger's best known students is Bart Ehrman. And Bart Ehrman popular author today and Bible scholar. He is very honest in telling us what modern textual criticism does to your faith in God. Ehrman uh, got his start at Moody and came to Metzger with a uh, born-again testimony and a belief in Scripture. Mo uh, Metzger was at Princeton. And uh, here's what he said. I did my best to hold on to my faith that the Bible was the inspired Word of God with no mistakes, and that lasted for about two years. I realized that at that time we had over 5,000 manuscripts of the New Testament, and no two of them are exactly alike. The scribes were changing them, sometimes in big ways, but lots of times in little ways. And it finally occurred to me that if I really thought that God had inspired the text, if He went to the trouble of inspiring the text, why didn't He go to the trouble of preserving the text? Why did He allow the scribes to change it? Well, that is the question, isn't it? But of course, we don't believe that God did allow the scribes to change it. And like his mentor, Ehrman is one of the greatest names today in biblical scholarship, but he believes nothing about a supernaturally inspired and preserved scripture. Why? Well, like Peter walking on the water, he went from believing to doubting. And when you begin to doubt, you're going to begin to sink. And he moved from a supernatural mindset to a humanistic mindset. With that in mind, let's go back to the interview that we played at the beginning of this video. On one side, I read books by David Sorensen, David Cloud, uh, even Sam Gipp a little bit. And, and then on the other end, I'm reading D.A. Carson, Mark Ward, uh, James White. 
But do you see any problem with that? Well, like Ehrman, Barzon is trying to understand this issue through human methods. Uh, debate. He's listening to two sides of a debate, and whichever one has the winning arguments, the side he's going to go with. In a debate, the most eloquent speaker is the one that carries the day, uh, not necessarily the man that's on the side of truth. He may lose the argument. Barzon said that for him, the debate was settled by the King James translators themselves, even though they could not have possibly been talking about anything related to today's modern textual criticism. And debate is not how we're going to settle an issue like this. The only way you can settle this issue and come out on the right side of it is through a knowledge of God. Jeremiah 9, 24 says, But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. And in dealing with this issue, the very first place you have to start is with a knowledge of God and who He is. Any other approach is going to end in failure and is going to lead you off in a wrong direction. And that's certainly the direction that Joshua Barzon is going. Those who believe in God's supernatural watch care over Scripture cannot answer every question on this issue, but neither can the skeptics. All they can tell you is that the Bible has been lost and they're in the effort to try to restore it. Most of them have already admitted that that will never happen. And in light of these changes that we've seen in the field of textual criticism, it's outrageous for somebody to come along and write a book and say that the King James translators would endorse modern textual criticism and what's going on today in that field. That's absolutely untrue. He wants to make this issue appear if it's only about readability, but it goes far, far beyond that. In accepting the modern versions, you're going to be linking yourself up with unbelievers who doubt the supernatural aspects of Scripture. No one has ever found the Scripture there, but many have lost their way going down that path. And we're already seeing signs that there is about to be a new movement away from the King James Version, and there is absolutely no doubt that it's going to lead to shipwreck for many.